This is my first ever cooking demonstration. Now, I do cook. I would not call myself a chef, uh, but I do cook. I cook for myself all the time. I enjoy it. This is my real kitchen. We are not in a donor's home. This is my kitchen, and this is where I am most comfortable. Now, normally, this wonderful table with the cutting board is not directly in front of my stove. It's usually over there, and my liquor cabinet is underneath it. So, like, all the, all the good stuff is down here, right? What else have I got down here? Oh. I'm a bourbon lover, what can I say? So all the good stuff is down here, but, um, but I've got everything, I think hopefully everything that I need. Now I went through the trials of the damned, trying to figure out how I would weave in Rossini's love of food uh, into this series about Rossini. As Rossini, uh, I, I like to refer to him as the Andrew Lloyd Webber of the early 19th century, because once he hit, he hit big. And he made lots of money on royalties and fees. And he, he really did quite well for a composer. He was probably one of the wealthiest composers of the 19th century. And with that came a large appetite. And so when he hit Paris, when he, he lived in Paris for a number of years later on in life, he made friends with as many chefs as he could make friends with. And of course, because he was so famous, they kept naming recipes after him. At latest count, I've counted 12 Rossini recipes, 12. And um, he made friends with a particular chef, Marie Antoine Carême, C-A-R-E-M-E. Marie Antoine Carême. Now, Carême was one of the developers of what we now call haute cuisine. Okay? I mean, that fancy schmancy, very rich, calorie full French cooking. Carême loved Rossini, loved his music, and Rossini loved Carême's food. And he had him create Rossini Tornados. And I thought, what a great idea. I'll cook one of these Rossini recipes for you guys. Um, and and it, it'll be a snap. Um, you know, I, I'll learn how to cook it and there'll be no problem. Well, <laughs> it is so incredibly complicated. And the other thing is that almost all of those Parisian Rossini recipes involve foie gras and truffles. Okay, I mean, how rich can you get, right? So Rossini Tornados or Tornados Rossini is a beautiful piece of beef filet uh, that you cook in a Madeira sauce. So there's, you know, you, I would have to learn how to make a Madeira sauce. And then um, you, you fry separately a nice thick slice of foie gras and put it on top. And the truffles are in the are in the sauce. I mean, not only is it complicated, but it's incredibly expensive. And I don't think during this period of time, <laughs> it's really a good look for the opera company to be promoting uh, Rossini tornadoes. So, uh, and, and then I looked at some of the other recipes. Well, virtually all of them involve truffles and foie gras. So there's no, uh, I, I, I'm not surprised that Rossini weighed 300 pounds. I mean, he was just huge, just huge. And he was always eating this terribly, terribly rich food. So I decided today to go back to Rossini's background. And of course, as we know from the lectures up to this point, he was a student at the conservatory, um, at the uh, uh, Conservatorio Filarmonia in Bologna. And he was born in Pesaro, which is not terribly far from Bologna. So surely Rossini knew pasta bolognese. And that's, it's relatively easy to make. So I've got all the fixings here. I don't know, I can't see all of you. So I don't know if any of you are following along. I'll try to be really careful and rather slow when I get into it. But um, this is 
I'm, I'm fairly certain this is a recipe that Rossini grew up with. So that'll be kind of cool, right? And it's, it's relatively easy. The only bad part is that you really want it to simmer for a good hour and a half, maybe even two hours. So just let it do its thing. And let me tell you, it's even better after you freeze it and warm it up again. All right, but, but I'm gonna start off with something that's relatively easy that is a Rossini recipe. It's called the Rossini cocktail and it could not be easier. I've got here strawberries. Now these are strawberries out of one of those bags of frozen strawberries and I just let them dethaw, right? Or not dethaw, no, I, I let them thaw. That's the correct usage. So I, you make a strawberry puree. So I'm putting the strawberries and their juice into my trusty Nutribullet, right? And it'll take like three pulses for this. You want like two tablespoons of, if you've got a standard champagne glass, you want uh, two tables, or uh, yeah, two tablespoons of the strawberry puree, and then fill the glass up to the top with Prosecco, which of course is the wonderful Italian uh, champagne. So I will pulse these and make a hopefully lovely <laughs> puree. That's really all I needed to do. It could not be simpler. And I'm gonna make one for Darren too, because Darren is here helping me out. So I will put in these beautiful champagne glasses, a little bit of the strawberry puree. It's actually a takeoff on the Bellini, which is also named after a composer, the Bellini cocktail. The Italians love naming their cocktails after famous composers, which I think is just appropriate. Mm, mm. See, that's why I wanted to do this. I get to taste all this stuff, it's wonderful. All right, then is this not the cutest thing you've ever seen in your life? It's a teeny tiny little bottle for two of, uh, of Prosecco. And I found them at Ralph's. They're really, really simple. You take the foil off and it, it comes off so easily. Well, um, you know, half of this is gonna be all over the kitchen anyway, so we're not gonna read it. And then top off the strawberry puree with your Prosecco. It will take the entire bottle. I tried it earlier today. All of these, all of these recipes are well tested. I'm sneaking up right behind And Darren is sneaking up <laughs> right behind me to get his, his Rossini cocktail. And this is so much fun. Look at how, isn't that, aren't they beautiful? They're really lovely. The only thing that I'll say is that these strawberries were not as sweet as I would like them. Come summer, get real honest to goodness strawberries and make your puree out of that. These lack a little sweetness and I'd like them to be just a little sweeter. Uh, a little toast, there you go. And there you are, easy peasy. Mmm. Mmm. Not bad. Not bad, very refreshing and so, so, so simple. Okay, now you already know, oh, um, I thought of something um, um, and I, I meant to do this at the top of, uh, of the lecture, but this is our fourth and final lecture as we talk a little bit about um, uh, food and Rossini and finish the four um, uh, session series. I want to again publicly thank Lori Bailey and the Central Library, especially Lori's Fine Arts Department, uh, the Fine Arts Collection at the Central Library downtown. Uh, I'm sure that she will post in the chat again a link to the Fine Arts Collection where you can find out more about opera, more about Rossini, more about the Barber of Seville. Um, and um, having us collaborate and partner 
was very appropriate this year because we're celebrating the 65th season of opera lectures at uh, the, Central, the Central Library downtown, which were begun by Veer Wolf, continued by me at Veer's invitation, and then Ron Shaheen took over from me. We've had a number of other guest speakers, but um, it really is a wonderful tradition. I hope we'll be able to continue it after the pandemic. Uh, it was a great partnership and resulted in, I think, making some new friends here uh, for San Diego Opera. So Lori, thanks to you and welcome all of you who came through the portal of the Central Public Library. Now, we're gonna show a brief video of how you start the um, pasta bolognese, this, this bolognese salsa or bolognese sauce. And we invited Mario Liga, L-I-G-A, Mario Liga. Now Mario is one of the co-owners of Rusti Cucina, which is a Sicilian restaurant directly across the street from my building. So it's on Park Boulevard, in the, in the 3700 block of, of Park Boulevard. I won't tell you which building I'm in, but I am, I am directly across the street and it's become my living room. I'm there at least once or twice a week, uh, just a wonderful place. And I invited Mario to come over and show us how he gets a, um, a bolognese sauce started. How did his grandmother, his nonna, teach him how to make bolognese sauce? And I thought that would be a great way to start. And then I'll do it all over again. But just love what a five minute video or so to give you an idea. And, and Mario is a charming guy. He, uh, he waits on the tables. He's back in, in the kitchen. He, he drinks, he sits around and drinks wine. He, he's a great guy. He visits with us. Wonderful, wonderful guy. But I thought it would be fun to invite him uh, to show us how to get this started with what we call a sofrito. I'll say more about that later. Let's take a look at the video. Oh, Kevin's internet just died. Oh no. Uh, let me go down to see if I can. Okay. Um, <laughs> Technical difficulties. The internet just died for Kevin at the opera who's been helping us with these videos. I promise we'll see it, but why don't I just get started because I, we've only got a limited amount of time. I want to at least get the heat going here. And Darren, you just let me know when he's ready. Okay, I'm going to see if I can and I'll stop what I'm doing and, and uh, we'll go. Okay. Uh, the first thing you wanna do is get your pan hot, right? So that is in the process of heating up. You want a couple of tablespoons of oil. Be generous with the oil because we're doing a sofrito and that is essentially a mirepoix. If you're familiar with French cooking, classic French cooking, so many things, particularly stocks and soups, begin with what we call a mirepoix. Um, and it is a carrot, a celery stick, an onion, chopped up, uh, could not be easier, chopped up and thrown into oil. The only thing I'm gonna do is add garlic to that, which Mario does not. You'll see in the video, he makes a point that bolognese is different everywhere and all over Italy. Everybody makes their bolognese a little bit different from everybody else. And in fact, the classic Bologna recipe for bolognese does not use tomatoes. Think about it. It does not use tomatoes. And how do I know that? I've been watching Stanley Tucci on CNN. Have any of you been watching that, that wonderful series about Italian food uh, and the Italian country? Um, it's just, it's so marvelous. And he was in Bologna and uh, he had one of the chefs make classic Napolitano, or excuse me, classic Bolognese. And she made a point of saying in that classic recipe, which we have from a very early cookbook, 
from that classic recipe, no tomatoes, which I think is just fascinating. I'm not doing a spectacular job with this. <laughs> I've never cut vegetables in front of people. Leave me alone. <laughs> oh, this is so much fun. I know my mother, Gracie, she's sitting there thinking, oh God, he's gonna cut one of his fingers. I'm being very, very careful. And I did um, sharpen the knife so that that would not happen. Now, the only thing different that I'm gonna do that Mario does not include in his, um, in his sofrito is a couple of um, garlic cloves. I am gonna use those. He did not, and I thought that was a little strange, but then I thought, you know, in Italy, they don't use garlic that much. It's the Italian-Americans that, um, that use garlic like crazy. And most of the Italian-Americans have a Napolitano background, particularly the ones that started in New York, you know, that emigrated and came over to, uh, to New York. A lot of them were from Southern Italy and you'll see more, um, I'm smashing this garlic root. You'll, you'll see more garlic used in the South than you will in the North. So I'm gonna throw into that hot oil, the garlic first. And by the way, you don't have to be real nice about these. Um, you don't have to dice this stuff. It can be coarsely chopped. I'm gonna let the garlic go just for a minute or so to get some nice scent. I'm gonna turn up the heat just a little bit. Oh, I hear it sizzling. I don't know whether you can. When we throw the onions in, you'll hear that. All right. <clears throat> so the onions, you see they're not they're not finely chopped, they're coarsely chopped. Put those in. Oh, I love that sound. The sizzle. Yes. Bravo. Beautiful. All right. In the meantime, I, sp <laughs> I suppose I should have chopped these first. So I'll turn the heat down a little bit so they don't overcook. So seriously, this sofrito, it could not be easier. I like to take a big um, carrot like this and cut it in thirds first. See how carefully I'm doing that? I've got to play the piano tomorrow. I've got a big gig tomorrow. And then cut lengthwise again. Not difficult. This does not have to be neat. And then just, in the smaller parts, I think you're hearing my entire liquor collection <laughs> making noise. Sorry about that. Yeah, okay, there's a lot of booze down there. Get over it. I like my booze. It's fun. What do you guys like to drink? I like a good dry martini or a Cosmo in the summer. I love a Manhattan when it's cold. A Manhattan when it's cold. And I'm sorry, I'm too far away from the um, laptop to see your comments. If you're making comments on my drinking, I'll find out later. So just. Be aware of that. Okay, throw in the carrots. Off they go. And turn that up a little bit because the celery will be really quick. Mm. Yeah, okay. And just start mixing those things around. Let the onions start to sweat. I haven't heard anything about the video. I hope we get it because Mario is charming. He's so much fun. And um, we really want to send some business to 
Rusty Cucina. It's a wonderful restaurant. All right, then the celery stick cut in thirds. Again, turn those over, cut them lengthwise. And that's about the right size. And turn them this way and chop, 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 chop. Getting my fingers out of the way. I promise, mom, I'm gonna be careful. This is the most dangerous part of the recipe for me and other pianists who like to cook. All right, so we put that in and that's what we call a sofrito. S-O-F-R-I-T-T-O. -T -T -O. Oh, come on, I've got... Oh. There's only five seconds, right? No problem. That's a pretty good... Okay. Um, sofrito, which as I said, is like a mirepoix. It's a great place to start this dish, an absolutely great place to start. And it brings so much flavor. Do not be afraid to salt and pepper as you're going along with the mirepoix, with the meat, once we, uh, once we get that started as well. Lots of pepper, lots of flavor. Okay. So everybody, I'm so excited. My guest today is Mario Liga. He is one of the co-owners of Rusty Cucina, and here's the secret. <laughs> the restaurant is right across the street from my building. In John Colvin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, that's my living room over there, <laughs> right? So uh, I'm so happy that you're here. I want to talk to you a little bit about Bolognese sauce, because Rossini did a lot of work in and around okay, yeah. Bologna. He was born in Pesaro, but but did a lot of opera in uh, Bologna and his student days were all spent in Bologna. So I thought, what a great idea. So we'd do a, a, Bologna, a Bolognese yeah, yeah. sauce. But I understand it's a little different depending on where you're from Correct. in Italy. And I think maybe people are watching the Stanley Tucci series on mm -hmm. CNN and up in Bologna. Everybody's got his own way to do it, you know. You know. No tomatoes up in Bologna. No tomatoes, but, but in Sicily. That's you grew up in, in Sicilia, in right. Sicily, in Sicilia, yeah. Palermo. Palermo. That's right. So you tell us, how, how do you do it? So how we do it? So I just follow my, my, my grandma's recipe. So, you know, she, she does the sofrito with the onion, the celery, carrots. So Not everybody a, puts celery, you know. On, and okay, the sofrito you know? is like uh, just, mirepoix. Mirepoix? Okay, yeah, I like that one. Yeah, so <laughs> it's just olive oil, and then we're going to start to do the sofrito with some onion, celery, carrots, and then we're going to be adding the meat. We yeah, so this beef. is... Ground beef and pork, we use sausage too, okay? okay? Very important for us, so we mix them together, okay? So, so not just ground pork, but ground sausage. Correct. Uh -huh. yes. So it's got a little salsiccia. bit of fatty, yeah. Pork, but what kind? This is a, I believe straight pork, yeah, you know. Straight, straight pork, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, La segreta. Okay. A good look at that. A beautiful, beautiful wine. Yeah. So not a red wine, but a white they use in Sicily, huh? Yeah. Yeah, I'll give you a little bit of that. So as I say, every region has its own way to do it, you know, and everybody's proud of it, of yeah. the way that they make it, you know? So they say, ah, my way is the right way, your way, it's like the carbonara, you know? Everybody's has its own way, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, what I would love to know is how Rossini liked it, but we don't know yet. Rossini, yeah, let's see. <laughs> That's a good kosher salt. a couple of cups. No, 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 no. You gotta go all the way. <laughs> that's, that's when it gets all the juice, you know? Uh, well, and so much of it cooks off. We're gonna, we're gonna, you know, it's gonna take a couple of time now to cook it off. Mm -hmm. That's the right way. Oh. This one, the wine is gonna help me. It's gonna 
Evap evaporate. Yeah, yeah, just, yeah. The, the yeah. Wood, It'll evaporate. go away. Yeah, yeah. It'll yeah. go away, and then. But it'll leave the taste. Oh my God! It's gonna yeah. absorb all the taste, you know. Now that's a whole little can. Yeah. So this one, yeah. So was it 14 ounces? No, we're not gonna put all of it. No, no, no. no, no but we're not gonna put all of it. We're gonna go little by little because this one it, it gets hard to dissolve on the sauce, you know. Yeah. I think it's gonna get the color, it's gonna give the flavor. That's beautiful already. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh. And then we just wait and let the we gonna let, let yeah, the wine gonna, cook down. It's gonna cook for a while now. Yeah. So, so it's how, gets how long? Tender. How long? I believe you know at least like for sure an hour and a half. Okay. Okay. For sure, and then you you know keep watching it. Okay. It's gonna take a little while to cook. Bravo! Uh, thank you for having me. Thank in. you yeah. so much. Uh, yeah, this will get us started. We're gonna repeat all of this with me, <laughs> yeah, <I think laughs> one step at a, at a time. But uh, I wanted us to have an idea of uh, how quickly it can go and how beautiful it, is, it looks. Yeah. So thank you, Mario. Thank you. Thank I'll you. see you at the thank restaurant. You, It's really the same thing that I did. We did forget one important thing. You know what this is, a bay leaf. We forgot the bay leaf when, when Mario was here. So we put in the bay leaf, stir that in. I want you to see where we are right now. And this went pretty quickly, right? Look at that, not bad. And all of that will cook down. Now. For the best part, and that's the vino. Oops. Uh, <laughs> okay, there we go. And it seemed to me that he used maybe three cups, but I'm just gonna eyeball it. Because as he said, all of that alcohol will evaporate. It will burn off. And it just leaves the most marvelous taste. So here we are. I'm trying to stoop down so you see me. <laughs> Not that you want to. Okay, here we go. I think that needs a little bit more wine, just a little, because again, it'll, it will cook off. So do not worry about that. Don't put the strawberries from your Rossini cocktail in the sauce. That's, that would not be good. Okay. Um, now, one other unusual thing that's in a classic Bolognese uh, that Mario did not use, and I am, and nutmeg. Nutmeg, isn't that interesting? But in the classic um, recipe in that book, way back from 1876, I believe was the cookbook, that first had the Bolognese recipe in it. You just a little bit of nutmeg and it creates a really nice finish. So I'm gonna spread a little, and it's, you know, if you want, you don't have to, you don't gotta. All right. And stir that all in. Oh, I can smell the, I can smell the wine. I can smell the nutmeg. It's all just coming together beautifully. I want to give you one more sort of close-up look. If you can see that, isn't that beautiful? It really is a thing of beauty. Now. I'm going to turn down the heat. A little bit. To a simmer. 
Don't cover it all the way. Leave a little, a little crack so that the steam can escape. You can let it simmer for 90 minutes um, at least, I would say, okay? So give it an hour and a half. If you've got time, let it simmer even longer. Let it simmer even longer. It's, it's just um, when all those flavors finally mix together, there's, there's just nothing like it. And the longer you simmer it and let it, let it do its thing, the better it is. And as I think I said earlier, uh, freeze it, take it out a week later. It is amazing, absolutely amazing. Now, <laughs> I'm gonna have a little bit more of my Bellini. Mm. And I was going to show you um, a finished sauce and how you would do the pasta, but my, um, my pasta water isn't quite boiling. Um, well, we've got 15 minutes. I may, I may get there, but I want to show you. This is the sauce that uh, Mario made for me and that I froze. And the only thing I did was add a little bit of tomato sauce, a little bit of tomato sauce to make it wetter. Um, so <clears throat> the amount of liquid, for instance, in I, uh, the recipe that we sent out, I said you could use chicken broth, you could use plum tomatoes and crush them in your hands and pour those in with their juice, uh, or, or you could use a, a, some kind of broth, or you could use wine, white wine always in a bolognese, classic bolognese, not red, not red. Now you can eat the bolognese sauce with a red wine on the side, but don't cook it with the red wine. It's much better with the white. Um, but it just depends on how wet you want your sauce is to, you know, to, to use more liquid. And any of those liquids will do, any of them will do. You'll also notice that I really let the meat brown a little longer than Mario did. Uh, and that can, be, that can be just so, 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 so helpful. Now, I do think that I have time to plate this for you. If we can get this linguine, I use linguine. It's better not to use uh, spaghetti, but use a thicker noodle like linguine, a pappardelle, even that thick, you know, um, would work. But I'm going to start that and get the noodles going because I want to show you how to plate this. And I thought it was so helpful when I saw it. Now, Nick, I did have a question for you that's not cooking related, if that's all right. Yes, 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 yes. You uh, have seen the, our production of Barber of Seville. And okay. some of the questions that were asked over our series uh, was how does this work with the, with the cuts that we had to make essentially for the, to get to our 90 minutes. So how was that for you? Uh, uh, to be honest, it was tough <laughs> because I'm familiar with every note of the opera. And so I missed the things that had to be cut. However, um, you know, I, I know this stuff. I've, I've played it, I've listened to it, I've been to it so many, many times. Uh, the important thing is that all, all the significant numbers are kept. Uh, there isn't anything I think that anyone in the general audience would miss from the Barber of Seville. But we had a very clear um, uh, mandate from, I believe, AGMA, the Singers Union, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? That's there? correct, yes. That, that it has to be 90 minutes. And this, again, is based on the safety of the artists, right? It's, it's based on the safety of all the people concerned that are on stage that uh, limiting the, the amount of time that you can have the singers on stage. So we had to do it. So poor Bruce Stasna, the conductor, <laughs> our music director, 
is the one who had to decide what to what to cut and what to cut and what to keep. And I I I don't wish that uh, decision making process on any opera lover. Uh, it would have killed me. I wouldn't have. I, it, it would have been a two and a half hour cut <laughs> out of a or opera. You know, it's just impossible. So well, yeah, I missed a little bit of that. But uh, in, in what's what's critical is that it tells the story. It moves the story along. And I think I said last week to you folks that just getting rid of most of the recitative is the easiest way to cut an opera of that period because there's so much of it. There's so much dialogue outside of the musical numbers. So um, I, as an expert, missed some of the things that you know were not there, but the singing is phenomenal. Phenomenal. The singing is so, so good. The production is fun. It's bright. It's colorful. It's very 60s. And I remember laughing and I remember the Smothers Brothers show and all those. So, you know, I think you'll have a lot of fun with it as well. Okay. Now, this is the sauce that Mario made for me. It's in my trusty little skillet here. Got a plate here, actually a bowl. Aren't these gorgeous? We got a store called Home Base back in the early 90s. And we got a set of eight, everything, you know, all the bowls, all the plates for less than $100. Uh, you can still get them on replacements.com. All right, so the pasta. As I told you, I made linguine because I want to, um, I'm losing everything tonight. Okay. I wanted to make sure that the pasta was wide enough noodle to be able to take the, um, uh, the sauce and pick up the sauce, right? So this is what you do. You take the noodles, put them directly in the pan, with the sauce, the pan that you made the sauce in. Toss. Oh my God, that looks so good. Oh! Now, some recipes call for using a cup of the pasta water, but because I added tomato sauce to this last night when I remade it after, after thawing it, um, I don't think I need it. So I'm just tossing it in the pan that it was made. I'm putting it in my gorgeous bowl. You see how much there's left, Darren? You can come upstairs and have some. I will be over in just a minute. I'm really hungry all of a sudden too, watching this. Yeah, there's a whole portion left. Oh my God, you guys, look at that. Look at that. That's just, and it picks up all that meat. I can see the sofrito, the carrots, the celery. Top with some freshly grated Parmigiano Reggiano. Oh, you're, you're putting the cheese on right at 6.30. How, what a, look, what a professional chef you are. Look at that, look at that. Is that a thing of beauty? Tell me. Now I want the applause. Not when I'm <laughs> playing the damn piano, not when I'm singing, not when I'm composing, yeah. when I'm cooking. I've never done this before. <laughs> and it was so much fun. Thank you all so very, very much. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you love the Bolognese sauce. I do. I can't wait to dig in. And uh, we'll see all of you at the opera. Ciao.